That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Once Within a Time, the new directorial... Effort. Effort from Godfrey Reggio, uh, co-directed by John Kane, who was previously an editor for Mr. Reggio, uh, which Oscilloscope Laboratories is releasing uh, in New York on October 13th and in L.A. on October 20th at Braindead Studios. Oh, wow. So uh, it, it will expand thereafter, but uh, initially those are the only two places you could see it. You're familiar with this director. Uh, yes, well, a lot of people are, because he's very famous for his trilogy, the, the Katsi trilogy, and I, I've only seen the first one, uh, Kayana Katsi from 1982, which is a, a Hopi word for, in short, meaning life out of balance. A comedic apocalyptic vision of the end of the world and the beginning of a new one, with unforgettable views and the innocence and hope of a new generation. What's your pull quote? As if to say every new beginning is some other beginning's end, Godfrey Reggio sifts through the ruins of our realities by meshing mythological origins together into the toxic vat of technological dependence in which we're culturally held captive. An explosion of visual templates and textures of art house dictated doom. My pull quote, once within a time is a spellbinding motion picture that would make for an excellent art installation. Yeah, I agree with that. It's 51 minutes long. I think technically 58, 58 through the end credits, so it's a medium length film. This is, I think, his only narrative, close to a narrative feature because his, his Katsi Trilogy's documentary, the last thing he did was in 2013, Visitors, which is also a documentary in dealing with our relationship and the ripple effects of technology. So if I, I had read the premise before watching it, if I hadn't read it, would I have interpreted it this way? Probably. It's... It's, there's no dialogue, it's just music. And the visuals, we start off with a woman in a very beautiful outfit that looks like maybe she's like Mother Nature with like a tree for a headdress and she's singing. It's beautiful. Uh, it's that, all beautiful. That's Susan Deheim, who's an Iranian singer and composer. And that's actually her voice. Oh, wow. I mean, she was, it, it was all beautiful. I took that as like, the, you said Tree of Life, like Mother Nature, the beginning. Then we move on to kids playing on a playground, which of course is like innocence, joy. Then we see someone like... I think it's kind of composites of Adam and Eve, really. A yes. man and a woman with their each in, their heads are encircled with a, like, a, like a mini mesh globe sphere. Then we see like images of hands holding smartphones. Mm-hmm. Greta Thunberg pops up, her little visual. <laughs> but I think it starts to show a decline because then we see, so maybe, so maybe like how technology is the decline of humanity. And then we move into like an industrial space. There appears to be like a dictator type person getting everyone riled up. Then all of a sudden we see like a missile launching or a rocket ship. And then what looks like a nuclear explosion. And then the landscape becomes sort of like post-apocalyptic total recall like a family inside of a bubble then we see like nature again like a tree popping up robots the cosmos then we see that woman singing again and then mike tyson pops up as like another sort of like leader speaking to the children who all follow him or almost like a pied piper but also, it, I think it's important to note back in the beginning that he uh, collapses the motif of the apple and Adam and Eve with technology. And both the, the apple that is bestowed upon Ad, the Adam figure, his head gets shaped in a box, like he's stuck. And then Reggio does the same thing with the cell phones kind of indoctrinating us. And then the globe is shown as being put in a box. That was my attempt at summarizing the story which was probably horrible but because no, it does feel kind of random the film is. does end with a title or an end card that says which age is this the sunset or the dawn in many languages um i thought it was beautiful and i think it's it's so interesting because i the way i envision this being viewed is like in some sort of installation where maybe there are many rooms playing the same film on loop and so as you're going through the installation you happen upon this this motion picture at any given point because at any given point if you watch it for the full runtime like it loops back around the ending is always going to be the same 
Sure. And I thought that was the magic of this story because there's really no story to be found, right? Like, <laughs> well, it's, I think it's supposed to make you ponder our own destruction really, sure. is what we're, but it, it, it also has this motif of children as in there's these close up, like extreme close ups on kids that are, seem to be maybe sitting in a circle, but that are constantly observing throughout this whole, the whole runtime, which is really, they're really watching the destruction of a doomed world, which is really how all of us are. Every time we grow up, we, we grow up mired in whatever is going on and whatever's come before. And we're always told that it's the end of times and that things are getting worse. That That's what, to me, it equated. It, it's it, it's about the apocalypse, but also it's like life's going to go on and there still has to be some sense of hope. Seeing all of these kids made me think of Whitney Houston and the greatest love of all. God. I believe the children are our future. Also, you referenced some of the scenes with the kids reminded me as well of that scene from Terrifier 2. Yeah. I where, forgot I thought about it. Where Art yeah. the Clown, like there's a commercial for his little like restaurant or whatever and the kids are being killed. Mm -hmm. That's kind of how it felt. <laughs> well, because it's creepy. It's, it's always kind of, mm, there's nothing really comfortable about this film except that it's very visually extravagant. The only other note is there is a little monkey wearing like those Oculus goggles. Like a VR. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The monkey's cute. I also like the little homage to, uh, well, you don't see Venus in the half shell, but that's the final image of the film. Uh, it reminded me, if you're a fan of the Quay Brothers or Matthew Barney and his Cree Master Cycle, I, I think this is definitely something you should seek out. Uh, it's, it's just such an awkward running time because yeah. we were talking, you know, if you were to buy a ticket to go see this, which really should be seen uh, on a big screen, it would have to be paired with something else. Uh, notably also, it was executive produced by Steven Soderbergh and Alexander Rodniansky. Uh, and I guess I see why. I, I overheard someone saying that Reggio is not doing well because uh, he's an, an older gentleman and I haven't substantiated that. But So this could, this could be the last thing we see from him. It's been a decade uh, since his last offering. But uh, I, if, also, of course, if you're a fan of the Katsi trilogy, which... You were on when I had. You were in the room when I had uh, the first one on, and it's it's transfixing. Oh, it we didn't even talk about the score. Like Philip Glass, one of my favorite composers of all time, who scored the Katsi trilogy, is also uh, working on this. And I mean, the blending of imagery and sound is is fantastic. Yeah, it's spectacular. I would absolutely recommend trying to find um, a screening. I, I do think it needs to be more immersive than sitting on your couch with, you know, looking at your phone while you're watching it. I agree. And I would, you know, if you're in LA, Brain Dead Studios, which used to be the silent theater. Oh, on Fairfax. Uh, uh, I, it's definitely worth checking out. I don't, it's, I feel like it's weird to give this a score, but what would you give it, I guess? Three and a half. I would give it four out of five. Anything else? No. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>